Hi, welcome back to Green TV. Today, we're gonna to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, and that is electric vehicles. I um, was late to get my Tesla, but I was early on to get a ride in the Tesla prototype before even Elon Musk owned the company. Um, that happened when I was doing my show on Green Street in San Francisco, 12, 15 years ago. Someone named Martin, somebody you guys might know, um, I think was running the company and they brought up a, a Tesla and I got to ride in the passenger seat. But then I drove a Toyota Prius for many, many years after that. My husband got the first Tesla in the family. And finally I said, wait a minute, I've been promoting electric vehicles and Teslas a long time. I want one of those. So I got a Tesla three and I love it. I want to uh, introduce some guests that I just met uh, not too long ago, last week, and we had a fascinating call. And you're going to get so excited when you hear about their passion for promoting EVs. In fact, they're evangelists, EV angelists. Uh, and you'll hear what got them so green car crazy and what they're doing about it, most importantly. So, welcome to the show. We have Buzz Smith and Ryan Baggett. And um, let's see, we'll start with you, Buzz. Tell us what your eco epiphany was what was your wake up call to the wonders of clean and green and quiet cars well for me it was a car accident believe it or not i was uh, driving to work at apple and um got rear ended on the freeway uh, kind of a funny thing is the reason i got rear ended is a fracking truck flipped over on the freeway and stopped all the traffic and here comes a big suv guy suv guy you know texting as he's driving crushes the rear end of my car. Fortunately, I was unhurt. And I'd been telling my wife for years, I was going to get a two seat convertible as my next car. And uh, she even sent me to a dealer where she saw a pre owned one that was just beautiful. And I went and looked at it and called her up and said, Hey, I put a deposit down. So we need to come on out to the dealership tonight and we'll buy this car. And she goes, you did what? And uh, we sat down and did the numbers and this was in 2012 and I could either afford the car or I could afford the gas for the car, but I couldn't afford both. And uh, I have to attribute the brilliance to my wife. She's the one that said, uh, well, what about these plug-in cars? Maybe we'll save so much on fuel. You know, we can have a really nice electric car. And so we went and test drove a couple of models that were available at the time. I ended up getting a plug-in hybrid, the Chevy Volt, uh, less than two months later, my wife got one. Our inside joke is we revolted. And uh, about a year <laughs> later, the dealership hired me as uh, their first salesperson that was going to focus on electric vehicles. And that's with no commission sales experience, no car, car sales experience whatsoever. And uh, I went ahead and took the leap. It was something I was passionate about. So I went and sold cars for six years. And you went from Apple to doing that. And Apple is certainly in the forefront of a lot of our new technology. So not such a crazy leap. No, in fact, it occurred to me that uh, moving somebody from gasoline to electricity is exactly like moving them from the Windows operating system to the Mac OS. You know, people think, well, it looks like this is a lot more expensive. And uh, but all my friends are, are just crazy about this. So, you know, I need to understand it. And, you know, the the Apple sales model in the retail stores is there's no pressure. You come in, you ask as many questions as you want. I led the team that sold the businesses. So these people were terrified of this decision. They were thinking, I'm going to put my whole business into these Apple computers. And what if my friends are just wrong? So uh, the same thing goes on in the electric vehicle world. People are like, all my friends are telling me to get an electric car, but what if they're wrong? And uh so I just applied the same sales techniques that I did in the Apple world, and it it, it turned out pretty well. I led uh, electric vehicle sales in the state of Texas for six straight years. Congratulations. We're going to hear more about that. But people are getting over the range anxiety as these become more prominent in our fleet, our national fleet of cars. Although you guys can tell me, last I heard, it was still just 2 to 3% of all vehicles leased or bought in this country are electric? Is that still accurate? I hope okay. not. Uh, so the actual figure is uh, sitting nationwide just under 1.4%. That's according to statista.com. Uh, however, there are more enlightened states like California, Oregon, Washington State, where the numbers are approaching quite nearly 3%. So just about tw or close to twice the national average of all new vehicles sold. If you throw leases in there, yeah, that convolutes the matter just a little bit. But 
uh, you were always going to find early adopters uh, in the more progressive parts of the country. So Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Austin. of course, Austin, Austin Texas. Yeah. Absolutely. And Dallas. Uh, the Dallas area Tesla Owners Club has over 300 members. That's pretty much constitutes most of the electric vehicles in <laughs> in uh in the texas. dallas area it's like wow and well no not texas because you have quite you have a substantial number of people that drive not just teslas but the vehicle that i own the chevy bolt uh in the dallas and in the austin area as well well you um, see a lot of those four pickup trucks right around here i live in hill country outside of austin and apparently now you can have an electric version of that the well, ford f-150 lightning is coming and then of course there's this baby now I'm not going to be, I'm not going to tell anybody this is our truck. This is, <laughs> highly, this, this is highly Photoshopped, but okay. But this is the actual picture of one of the beta models uh, of the Lordstown Endurance. Uh, it's an electric truck. And Buzz and I have talked about this for the better part of a year, that this is going to be the tipping point. People aren't going to see electric vehicles as falling into one of two camps, either this is the super expensive Tesla that I can't afford because even though there is the Model S and even though there is the Model uh, 3 and the Model Y, right, um, they still look at a price tag of at least $40,000. And for someone that's newly graduated from college, $60,000 plus student loan debt, you know, hanging over their neck, that's just not feasible. And on the other hand, there's Oh, that's a cute little vehicle there. And it's a BMW i3 and it's got, you know, 13 inch tires. And I would never take a girl out on a date in that. That's kind of the impression. Okay, let's fix that. Let's offer more models, more diversity. Okay. And when you go through states like Western Colorado and Idaho and Oregon and Texas, an electric truck is going to completely change the way people think, oh, this is now a viable car because this is the kind of vehicle I would drive. There's a reason that the Ford F-150 has been the most popular vehicle, not just the most popular truck, but the most popular vehicle. Because oh, I don't get it. <laughs> since, ni- <laughs> since, since 19... I'm a California girl. Why would I understand this Texas phenomenon? <laughs> yeah. Well, Texas, Oklahoma... Kansas, Nebraska, you know, across every state, the most popular vehicle sold uh, has been the Ford F-150 since 1974. Because? Since, since I was two. Because that actually fits more people's lifestyle who don't live in, who don't live in uh, urban areas. They need something that they're going to, you know, haul around. Like I, okay, so I have a Chevy Bolt but I also have a little 1988 Ford Ranger with almost 300,000 miles on it because there hasn't been and really still isn't an electric truck around. I haul around mulch and stuff from the Home Depot and from the garden center and everything in the back of a little Ford Ranger. Once I have you know, a viable option, the Lordstown Endurance is the one I really favor just because it also is, it's the story of the underdog it's we're going to bring back American industry and in the automotive, uh, in the automotive sector, especially we're going to create hundreds of thousands of jobs for people in the Rust Belt that has been largely ignored. And it, we just we think, OK, well, we'll just push this problem off to some other day. It, yeah, no, now's the time we reinvigorate the American economy by building electric trucks and building them here. Here being the United States. Right in the good old US of A. And, and these are built at the uh, former GM facility purchased by and operated by Lordstown Motors in Lordstown, Ohio. So it's not going to be Detroit centric, this electric uh, vehicle transformation? Oh, no. Oh, no. Evolution? No. No, in fact, the, uh, the valley where Lordstown is uh, located, they're starting to now call it the Electric Valley. So it's... Uh, they're really pushing for electric vehicle adoption. And, you know, like you, I've never owned a pickup truck. My dad had a pickup truck my whole life. I'm just not a pickup kind of guy. 
although I have to admit the cyber truck from Tesla kind of has me. I think that's really cool looking. But in car sales, what I discovered is that 46 out of the 50 U.S. states, the number one selling vehicle is a pickup. Yes. Well, I, I There's a country I, song that goes this way. It says, there's something women like about a pickup, man. But I tend well, to get that one day. <laughs> I notice when I notice those trucks and they are everywhere, half the time there's nothing in the back. Now, maybe they're oh, coming yeah. back from their trip. I don't know. But it, it's sort of like the moms who were driving the giant SUVs. And if there was a kid in there, they were so small, you couldn't see them. So why do they need a excursion to take their baby around? But don't get me started. That actually is why I started Don't Be Fueled back in 2002. Um, Mothers for Clean and Safe Vehicles to point out that we're going into Iraq for oil and um, all these moms and not just moms, Americans are in love with these giant SUVs and they're so wasteful in terms of the pollution and the carbon pollution. We were way ahead of our times and the mom, soccer moms thought we were trying to take away their vehicles as if we could, but we were just trying to educate and then trying to get a list of moms who said, if you build them uh, fuel efficient hybrid minivans, SUVs, we will buy them. Well, years later, Dave Bartmus um, Ford told me, no, General Motors, that that, that did make a difference in terms of their um, promoting the uh, EV1 a couple of years later. Anyway, I digress. I wanna hear about you guys and what you're working on because I think you've really identified a problem spot um, that has been slowing, not accelerating adoption of electric vehicles. And that is at the car dealership. Yes, that, that's, that is the case. And one of the biggest complaints of EV buyers is they walk into a showroom and start asking questions and they quickly discover that they know more about electric vehicles than the salesperson does. And, you know, some salespeople will just give you an answer whether they know it's right or not. And uh, other salespeople will defer you to someone else or try to talk you out of an electric vehicle because they don't want to lie to you, but they don't have the answers and they don't want to look uninformed. Um, there's another dynamic at play, and that is the hourly rate of pay. Now, car salespeople generally are 100% commission-based. If they don't sell a car, they don't make a dollar. And so an EV potential buyer comes in, and uh, when you compare that to a truck buyer, truck buyer comes in, and they're going to ask him, okay, crew cab, double cab, regular cab, long bed, short bed, four-wheel drive, two-wheel drive, what color do you want? and the deal's done. They'll find it in inventory, they write the deal up, and you make a pretty nice commission very quickly. So your hourly rate of pay is very high. Now, somebody comes in thinking about an electric vehicle, they have tons of questions for you. And even if you're an informed salesperson, you'll spend an hour talking to them about answering their questions. And then they'll say, well, you know, I've never thought about it that way before. I'm gonna go home and think about this. And they go home and they think about it, and they come back with more questions that their friends have given them because they're trying to talk them out of making a mistake. So they come back in, they spend another hour with me, and then they go, okay, those are good answers. I'm going to go think about this some more, and they'll leave. And so this might happen three or four times before they're finally comfortable enough to say, you know, this, is, this sounds good, and I think I'm ready to buy this thing. Well, what that means is you got, say, X commission for selling a pickup in one hour, or you get a slightly smaller commission for an electric vehicle, typically, for four or five hours of work. Well, every smart salesperson is going to go, well, I'm not going to work for one-fifth the pay. And so when you come onto the dealership lot, they're going to blow you off. They're going to, they're going to hand you off to someone else or try to talk you out of an electric vehicle. I experienced that in Marin County. Everybody does. Yeah, I mean, even in California, though even in California, where you expect it to be, you know, really accepted. And Ryan had mentioned earlier, the percentage of cars that, that are out there today that are electric. And the thing that is important, and this is what the dealerships are finally waking up to, is that adoption of new technology is not linear. It starts out very slowly. The modern electric cars, starting with that Tesla that you test drove, are now 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And so we are leaving the early sales stage and what happens next in the graph is sales just suddenly skyrocket. We're seeing that happen now. Before the Tesla Model 3 actually went into production, they already had 400,000 reservations. The Tesla Cybertruck that hasn't gone into production yet already has 1.25 million reservations. 
And Ford has, uh, I believe it's 120,000 reservations for that F-150. So I have been just, you know, again, I'm not a pickup truck guy, but having sold vehicles, I know that the the vast majority of vehicles that are going to sell are going to be pickup trucks. And so I've just been waiting. Come on, electric pickup trucks. Well, this is the year. That Lordstown pickup that's uh, right behind Ryan there goes into production next month. And next month starts in a couple of days. So the first full-size electric pickup will be in production within the next 30 days. I'm really laughing. Nice. My, husband, my husband's not a pickup truck guy and he got on the waiting list for a Ford pickup. I said, honey, that's so, so not you. And he said, I think they're going to be so valuable. The resale price could be high or something. He's an early adopter, whether it's Apple or Tesla. Yeah. And, and I even working the Houston Auto Show, the, the Ford announcement was shown one evening while I was on the floor of the show. And we had uh, the ability to webcast their reveal of the lightning right there on the show, on the floor of the show. Uh, the next day I was standing there and when I work the car show, I have this red sequin blazer. I mean, I really go big on the EV Angelism. Like, yes, you know, I'm here to spread the good news. Can't ignore him. <laughs> yeah. So there was no ignoring me. And this guy comes and stands next to me and we're watching a replay of the Ford announcement. And he looked at me and said, you know, I have been against electric cars all this time because they just weren't what I wanted. I wanted a pickup. He goes, I've driven pickups all my life. He goes, after that Ford announcement, I know that my next vehicle will be an electric truck. And, and I'm getting goosebumps just telling that story because that's, that's the tipping point that I've been waiting for. It's the tipping point I've been telling people about. And so this is about to happen. We're going to have this takeoff. And the important thing for the salespeople to realize is that the opportunity for them increasing their uh, income and their value uh, is right now. And it's going to be phenomenal. Um, I've been fortunate enough in my career that I've ridden three waves like this when that, that wave just takes off. And in one point, I tripled my income over just a three-year period. So it's that kind of opportunity that's right there. Well, there's a negative side to that opportunity. If you don't take advantage of that opportunity, you can be someone like um, Nokia, Motorola that ruled the cell phone world. And you can be nobody three years later if you don't see these trends coming and adapt to them. So you're doing something interesting. You're actually educating car dealer salespeople on this. And I want to hear how you do that. But I want to go back to Ryan for a minute because you're dealing with part in part. You're doing a lot of things. You, you're plugged into a lot. Ha -ha. The charging system, you're making it better, more efficient, more information to people who might be running low on electricity as we were when we drove my husband's Tesla from San Francisco to Austin three years ago. And we did fine. Tesla chargers all the way, except we all of a sudden we're 10 miles short in the middle of nowhere, New Mexico, but because of plug share, we found a nearby RV park and it was fine. It took a little bit longer than the Tesla supercharger. The woman at the RV park wouldn't even take our $20. It was just like so exciting to, you know, have found her. They were so effusive, you know? So yeah, the charging system obviously has to ramp up equally fast. Is it happening, Ryan? It is. Um, so first I want to say, in case you didn't believe that this man will actually get in a red sequin jacket, <laughs> this is the... This is the convicting evidence, Your Honor. Here it is. <laughs> neither looks like an orchestra conductor or a carnival barker, but neither. <laughs> I, he, he is the EV Angelist and the original, as the kids say, the original OG, uh, as that is. But um, yeah, um, about, well, there's three reasons that people uh, generally fall into one of the three general categories where people don't purchase electric vehicles. One is the cost, okay? I've got a good friend, lives in the Denver area that went to go EV shopping. He ended up getting uh, a Nissan Leaf, but when he was looking, he was looking for that, okay, we're about to have children here, so we want a you know, SUV, maybe a mini SUV, and they looked at the Kia Kona. There's an, in, there's an, indus, uh, an internal combustion engine model of the Kia Kona, and then there's an electric version. You're looking at a $33,000 price tag versus a $49,000 MSRP. $16,000 Delta? How do you explain that? Part of what we do with the EV Angelus is say, okay, well, you know, in my Chevy Bolt, I haven't put a drop of gas in this car. 
in three years time. Okay. $300 a month, 3,600, 4,000 some odd dollars a year, $12,000 in just three years. And the life of this car will be eight years. So 32,000 to $35,000. And now let's think about oil changes, transmission fluid changes, all the things that I don't have to do. So it's, it's why do you buy a Mac? And Buzz, yes, I'm going to do this. <laughs> oh, I know. He's, 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 he's waiting for this. That's it. Go, go Sanford. <laughs> um, why do you buy a Mac? Total cost of ownership over, you know, buy a PC. Got it. Um, I'm a bit of a tinkerer, so I still mess with my Windows and my Linux. Um, the second reason people don't buy electric vehicles is what we mentioned earlier, the lack of available diversity in form factors. Super expensive car, cute little jelly bean with 13-inch wheels. I'm not going to take a girl on a date in that. You know, now I'm way past the age where I'm asking young ladies out, so not much of a factor for me. The third reason, though, is range anxiety, like you experienced, okay? Uh, how do I know that that little green pin on my digital map, and maybe I can share, can I share screen here? So first of all, this is a map of a 3,400-mile uh, round trip that we're planning to take an electric truck on from Denver to Olympia, Washington come along some of the areas that were devastated by the wildfires uh, and by uh, uh, a beetle infestation that you can actually see this is the result of climate change. But let's go through here, staying with the point, is these little orange pins here are DC fast charge stations. And these green are a level two charging station. You get about, on average, 25 miles of range per hour that you're plugged in on a level two charging station. But what if when you pull up to this station, because PlugShare said that it's, you know, an available station and that it's working, you get up there, the screen is blank and there's a piece of paper stuck on the side that says, sorry for the inconvenience, temporarily out of service. Well, that's a problem. So I built a software that enables you to, see at three minute intervals whether that charging station is functioning or not. All the stations are green. They're are indicated by a green digital pin until one sends back a message that it's not functioning as it, uh, as it needs to. And then the pin will be yellow, orange, red, or black, depending upon the severity that it happens to be broken. If some bubba like what happened in Denver happens to run over one because he doesn't like the whole you know, way the world's changing, yeah, it'll be black. It means you have to have a field tech out there to fix it. But most instances, it's going to be, oh, it turned yellow because Buzz got there ahead of me and he plugged in his vehicle so it's not available. Well, this says to me, oh, okay, I see there, oh, that one's occupied, so are there any other stations? That, yeah, there's actually two bollards there. I can plug in right next to Buzz and get and go, or they all happen to be occupied, so I need to choose the charging station that's two miles down the road. That's brilliant. Um, so one of the trends we're seeing, um, Tesla certainly, I think, was the prototype for not needing dealerships. They just had showrooms. And that at first seemed very disruptive, but it kind of works. But Buzz, I think this is your area. You've talked about why we shouldn't just shut down the dealerships and let you know showrooms show off the EVs. First of all, most of the big three don't just have EVs. Uh, you know, I want to talk about Rivian, by the way, because they're kind of up and coming and exciting. But what, what about this? On the one hand, do the research in person, brick and mortar, get all the information, quiz the salesman, and then go buy it online. And, and cars are almost there, I guess. But why do we not want to see the end of dealerships in the near term anyway? Well, I think the biggest deal is that um, there is a phrase that's uh, slightly off color, but uh, it's butts and seats. And that is how you sell an electric vehicle. Very few people go out and think, I want to buy a car that's really good for the planet. Instead, they say, I want a car that gets great miles per gallon. I want to get a, get a car that has great acceleration and great handling. I want a car that has very low total cost of ownership or maintenance. And those are the things 
that drive people to buy a car? Well, the impression people have is that an electric car is like a, a, a golf cart. There's not going to be any performance. It's not going to be fun to drive. And the, you know, quite frankly, a lot of the models they've seen up to this point have not been very attractive. Well, that's all changing, but you still need to get someone in the seat of that car to suddenly press that accelerator down. And then they're like, okay, where do I sign to get one of these? Because it's, it's a life-changing moment for them. So that's the that's one reason to keep the dealerships in the game. The other one is the distributed service that they have. Even in small towns, you will find a Ford or Chevy dealership. And yeah, today they probably can't work on your electric vehicle, but this change is coming. They're going to be able to work on these cars. And then as you cross country, it's not like they have to fly a service person out to where you are in rural America or that you have to have your car towed to a major city to have it worked on. You can have it worked on in any small town. So that's what the, the dealerships bring to the game. Now, they've got to change. They've, they've absolutely got to change the way they do business. Um, and, and car salespeople like to think of themselves as um, automotive consultants, that they help you find the right car, the right fit for you. But in the real world, most of us were sales clerks. You came in and told us what you were looking for, and we found it in our inventory and started filling out the paperwork with you. That's not really a consultant. That's not really teaching anybody what they need to know. So it occurred to me that we have to increase that hourly rate of pay for salespeople, and we do that by having educated consumers go into the dealership instead of them going to the dealership for that education. We're taking some of that workload off of the salesperson. Now, this is being handled by electric utilities, by environmental groups, by uh, EV groups like, say, Plug in America or Texetra here in Texas that are trying to educate the consumer before they get to the dealership. But we need to get all of those forces working together. All of them right now are reinventing the wheel. They're all creating their own websites. They're all creating their own video material. So one thing I'm doing in the uh, Texas Electric Transportation Resources Alliance is trying to get these groups to work together. Now, at the same time, I'm going over to the car dealerships and I've developed a training program for car dealerships. And the training program is not just for the salespeople. 99% of all the training that goes on in a car dealership is aimed at the salesperson and it's memorizing numbers and statistics, you know, gear ratios and trucks, things like that. And that's, that's just not the way it's going to work in the electric vehicle world. There is too much to learn and there's easy, easier ways to learn it, which is why this class is broken into a management section and a sales section. So in the management section, I'm talking to dealership owners and their managers about what has to culturally change in the dealership to make them more successful and to make it easier for salespeople to sell those cars. When I get in front of the salespeople, it's talking to them about how electric vehicle sales is different. I mean, it's... Uh, and you can't make any assumptions. You could have someone come in and say, hey, I'd like to look at an electric vehicle. And you go, yeah, we've all got to be concerned about our planet and about global climate change. And then you've accidentally said that to a conservative who was thinking about getting an electric vehicle. And they turn around and walk out because they don't believe in climate change. Which, so which one of the things is going to change that. You watch. Yeah, before we're working that, on that, that too. Ignorance not be an impediment to saving the planet. No more. Not on my watch. But it won't be the prime in the near term, it won't be the primary reason somebody buys a car. And so well, we've got to, the weather lately. It ain't normal, but don't get me started. You're right. You're right. But still, 50% of the people in this country, because we are so polarized, refuse to believe that has to be man made. Yep, and well, so you know instead the of trying to was man made, it was made by Republicans. Let's just call it what it was. You know. <laughs> but what but you can't okay. have that argument on the sales floor because if you do, all you're doing is wasting your time uh -huh. for zero dollars. Uh -huh. So again, for the salespeople, they need to avoid that subject and they need to focus on what is going to get this person to buy the car. And in the EV world, it is just what a hoot they are to drive. And um, that's that's what lit me up originally. Uh, my wife and I thought that we were environmentalists when we hiked in the national parks. If somebody dumped trash on the hiking trail, we'd pack it up and carry it out with us. But we had a 3,700 square feet, our uh, home, our electric bills were $650 in the summer. And one day we just looked at each other and our cars changed us, but we looked at each other and said, what are we doing? 
So we downsized our home, downsized the property. Now my wife makes me uh, mow and edge the lawn, but I've got lithium ion powered lawn equipment to do that with. We put 38 solar panels up on the work roof. So charging our electric cars, I've had all three of them charging at the same time on a summer's day. And I walked over to the side of the house and the light meter was still going in reverse. I was selling surplus back to the grid. Well, once you start experiencing that lifestyle, you know, how inexpensive it is to operate the car, how convenient it is to refuel at home, your life changes. Also, when you live in Texas and you have to have air conditioning, but you move to California where you open the window and got the ocean breeze and you're eco guilty, having Tesla solar panels takes away from that guilt. Not 100%, because let's talk about this for a minute. Let's face it, our grid is not 100% renewable energy. How important is that transition if we're at the same time making this transition and pushing, promoting electric vehicles because you still have to charge them? Well, that's actually one of the cool things is, and people don't ever think about this, but what car can you buy that gets cleaner and cleaner the longer you own it? With a gasoline car, you know, your piston wings start to wear it, you know, manifold gaskets start to go and the car just starts polluting more and more as you're going along. Well, as we modernize our grid, as we move to renewable energy, then the energy going into these electric cars is getting cleaner. And so the impact of driving that car becomes less and less over time. And so that's the cool thing about electric car. You know, you've got the gasoline savings and total cost of ownership that goes on the whole time you're owning it. And then the pollution level of that car gets cleaner and cleaner as the grid gets cleaner. So that, I'm really excited about that. Also, I, I've not taken my Tesla in for repairs. Um, I've gone in a few times when I, it's so smart. You know, you've got a laptop basically is all you've got. And sometimes I like can't get my radio to work and it's so complicated. There's not just one button. Sometimes that's a problem. And, you know, other than that, I haven't like, you, you don't need to go in very often at all. Um, just as you're learning the car perhaps. Uh, so it's really important, obviously to green the grid. Needless to say, do you feel confident? Let's go back to Ryan, that that's going to happen soon enough in real time to not make us be creating more of a problem before we get to the solution in terms of needing more electricity. Okay. So I'll, I'll share this with you. Um, this is what I believe will happen within the next, it'll start within the next five years. It will rapidly accelerate within 10 years and soon you will see this all over the country in every Walmart, Kroger, Tom Thumb, Safeway, Publix parking lot. You'll see solar enabled carports. We'll love to park in the shade because, oh my gosh, have you ever parked out in the North 40 and your legs are melted halfway up to your knee by the time you get into the damn store? No, no. Okay. <laughs> I live in Texas. It's August. I understand. So yeah, you're coming from Marin County to Austin, and I think you're you're a new Austinite. Yeah, you're going to get to experience some really hot summers. I lived in Austin for 23 years. Hmm. We already but have. I've been here three summers, and and you should have seen my face when our next door neighbors fought our solar panel installation when it was 108, the sun beating down, and their grandkids were in the pool. And I just thought, you know, what are they going to say they did to combat climate change? when you know, the kids were in the pool and it was 108, you know, and yeah, they fought them because they don't like the idea of solar panels. And I said, I guess we're not in um, California anymore. I guess it was the concept of solar panels, but then again, a lot of the households in our neighborhood, they're oil and gas families. So that's what we're up against. But it'll absolutely change. And uh, if I can, you know, send uh, just a quick uh, screen share here again, solar car parts are gonna look just like this. Okay, uh, you'll put electric vehicle charging stations on the underside. Now, I'm not sure where this is. This is just one I, you know, put up by you know searching solar carports uh, pictures. You can find this anywhere. There's lots and lots and lots of it. Um, now, we've all been into a Walmart. We know that you can go in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you go into a Walmart and the the store is 30, 40, 50 feet tall, but it's only one story. The footprint of the Walmart is, you know, two or three football fields. And why? Because the point is you go in there and you are so 
psychologically overwhelmed, especially if you're a man. Okay, and we were the hunter parts of the equation. Y'all were the gatherers. So y'all do this a lot. Women do this a lot better than we do. Uh, at least me. I'm just going to speak for myself here. And the whole point is get lost in there and buy a lot of stuff that you don't need. Meanwhile, what are the damages that are caused by that? We have this enormous parking lot that all the runoff and you will see drought in Austin and you will see massive flooding in Austin. And I mean, I, I, <clears throat> I drove down to San Antonio from Austin in a time when I-35 South in 2015 was a literal river because of all the runoff. So there's that. Well, in Austin, it's a microcosm of the floods on the East Coast and the drought on the West Coast because it's obviously extremes. So let's do something. Let's do something completely radical. Let's dream for a minute here and say, okay, um, I park in the shade. I plug my car in. Whatever grocery store I happen to be at, and let's say it's Whole Foods because they're progressive. Um, they're going to pay for the first hour that I'm on that charging station. And it's going to cost them <laughs> two bucks. But when I go in, I sit down at a restaurant. And I get handed an iPad type computer and I order whatever food I want at the restaurant, which is like a, a Chili's or, you know, a 54th Street, something like that. Not a, not a Subway's or a Mickey D's. Order my food. Okay. Submit my order. Now I sweep up a swipe over and I get all of my dry goods stuff. You know, the things that I don't want to squash and examine and, you know, look at, you know, toothpaste. No one's, you just put it in the cart and go right now. Your laundry detergent, your dishwashing soap, your bar soap, all that stuff. I'm going to order all these just like I've been ordering, you know, you know, during the pandemic off of Amazon, uh, get all that stuff and it says, okay, Mr. Baggett, your order comes to $110. Do you want curbside pickup? Sure. It's uh, what, a 3% upcharge. Pff, no problem. Three bucks. So Meanwhile, instead of having to push a grocery cart up and down every last blasted aisle, you know, and I always get the cart with the wheel that sticks, always. <laughs> I thought I did. You too. You too. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's way back in the day, there was an HBO special called Not Necess or HBO show called Not Necessarily the News, and Rich Hall had a thing on there called Sniglets. He, had, he even had a name for that, a monster. <laughs> I was like, oh. every time I got the one. So let's just dis let's dispense with all that. The footprint of the grocery store is remarkably reduced because it's now 10 stories tall. It, there's an automated picking system inside there. It takes your order, goes and gets all of the items. And there's a human person down there at the bottom that says, okay, I look at the the scan label on there and said, okay, it has this, 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 all the items are there. Quality control sends it up. You wanted curbside delivery. So they put all your, your dry goods, grocery, uh, grocers into a compostable or recyclable cardboard box and put it up at the front of the store. You go get your vehicle or, you know, maybe you can even have your autonomous vehicle drive right there to the curb for you. Somebody loads it in the back for you and off and away you go. You and your kids and your husband are fed. You've got all your dry goods groceries. Now you can, you know, walk, walk or go over to the local farmer's market and get your produce, the stuff that's not in that kind of grocery store, you know, that concept. And oh, by the way, your vehicle is now completely charged. Yeah. You know, when you, we all this great stuff. You know, the, the Tesla supercharger stations tend probably like all of them um, to be in shopping centers where you can shop, where you're encouraged to shop and eat. And of course, what happens is you get so busy shopping and eating, our car's done, darn, you know, and you know, you can't stay there too long because people are waiting for it. So uh, that I'm sure your technology will, will help smooth that out. But uh, you'll, we're you'll have, you'll have 30 or 40 EV charging stations down the entire row underneath a carport that has solar panels on top of it. And here's the better part. Back in February, Texas had this massive freeze. Over a oh, hundred people I died. Yeah, than, over a hundred people died. I said, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and this is because we do something really dumb. We build a nuclear power plant or a natural gas burning power plant 
way the heck out in the country somewhere. And then you have miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of transmission lines, which do get ice on them. And when they do collapse, then you suddenly have massive power outages. Wait, it wasn't the solar panels? No, it wasn't the solar panels or the windmills or anything else that a certain lieutenant governor <clears throat> down in Texas said it was. No. But let's do this. If you have those solar car, uh, solarized carports, then you create microgrids. Does it make more sense to have your point of production feet away from your point of consumption or miles and miles and miles and miles and miles away from your point of consumption? Sounds like car logic to me. So Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Couple of things. Tell uh, Rivian is uh, the next up and coming thing. What are they going to bring? If Tesla made electric cars sexy, and I guess Lordstown's going to make them muscly, that's a word. Um, what is Rivian going to do to revolutionize further? The, this um, is the this is actually pretty cool. The uh, the thing that I really push the dealerships to realize is an econo box is not sexy at all. You know, people, yes, they need a car that's inexpensive to operate to get them and work and all, but they they think about what am I going to do with that car on the weekend? I want to go kayaking. I want to go mountain biking. You know, they, I want to go camping. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing is that these electric vehicles can be adventure vehicles. And you do have companies coming online like Rivian that have that mindset from the very beginning. They've already created a, an image of one of their trucks with a tent that pitches over the, the bed of the truck. In fact, rises above it so you can still store things underneath the tent. And they have a really cool pull-out cooktop. I mean, it's a kitchen that pulls out from between the cab and the bed, and it just pulls straight out. And of course, it's an electric cook uh, cooktop going off of the electric battery pack. But no longer do you have to carry around this Coleman stove with these, you know, things full of gas. Now it's just going to be an electric cooktop that pulls right out of the truck. And when you're done, you just push it back into the truck. You've got the frunk up in the front with, you know, 110 outlets on it. So you can recharge your power tools or your flashlights or whatever you need for camping, uh, you know, instead of a gas lantern or a gas uh, uh, device, you can have an electric device that you just plug in to the truck. Yeah. We went paddleboarding like Travis a couple of weeks ago and they were new and we were so it took so long to pump them up, hand pump them. We were exhausted, too tired to go paddling. It was a really windy day. So we just took them out to say we went paddleboarding. But my husband then ordered the electric one, which guess what? We're going to plug into the car to get Absolutely. the car. We need to blow it up hopefully faster and easier. Okay, last question. And that's so Rivian, but Rivian is not just going to be trucks, is it? They have an SU, a full-size SUV called the uh, R1S. The R1T is their pickup truck. So those are their first two models that they've announced they're coming out with. And both of those should go into production uh, early next year, maybe even January, February. And they are about to have an initial, initial public offering. And I believe, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, that they're looking for a valuation of $80 billion for a brand new company. And they're already, they've received so many orders that they're already looking for a location for their second factory. And uh, Texas is in the, the finalist list for that. So it could be that two really cool new pickup truck designs, the Tesla Cybertruck and the Rivian uh, R1S and R1T will be produced in Texas. So there's no danger of it becoming another Fisker fiasco. Not that we have time to go into that, but I guess we learn, right? I think Rivian is, it's going to be a real IPO. It's not going to be a uh, special purpose acquisition company merger. So I think this is going to be one of the most solid uh, financing agreements for a new company that we've seen in the EV sector. I'm really optimistic. And the people that I know that are on the waiting list for Rivian, they just can't wait for those trucks to get here. The, I've seen them in person. They're phenomenal looking vehicles. I think they're going to be a big hit. Well, that excitement is part of it. I remember waiting for you know, my husband's first Tesla and it was countdown, you know, and it, it, it was truly exciting to get it. And once you drive it, you're like hooked, I'll never drive a regular car again. Um, so, but the last question is about batteries. Okay. First of all, how long are they made to last? Because people in the beginning were saying, you know, whether it was my Toyota hybrid or the Tesla, you're going to have to replace the battery and it's really dangerous environmentally to dispose of them. And then there's the problem of them exploding or catching fire. If you have an accident, not that cars with full fuel tanks don't have a problem igniting. But um, yeah, last, last thoughts on that. 
Well, I, uh, what most people don't realize is in the United States, each year, almost 200,000 gasoline powered vehicles catch on fire. Now, when it's a Tesla, it's on the first page of every website out there. It's great clickbait. People are going to look at all your advertising. Media, all over social oh, media. Yeah. It's wildfire. Yeah. Yeah. And all your friends that knew better than to get an electric vehicle immediately are going to send you emails linking to the article. You know, people love to, to rub your nose in it. When they Tesla, think hate, they... Tesla hate is a whole other topic, but hopefully we're past that. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we're past that. Um, I don't see that as, as really being an issue going forward at all. Um, the batteries are warranted. Almost every manufacturer warrants them, warrants them for eight years, a hundred thousand miles. I believe Hyundai goes 10 years, a hundred thousand miles, or maybe it was Kia. I'm not sure which one, but you know, if they're warranting them for that long, then they expect them to last at least slightly longer than that. We've already seen a Chevy Volt plug-in hybrid go 475,000 miles on its original battery. We've seen Priuses go a million miles in New York City as taxi cabs. So if you, you know, take good care of the car, make sure it's got plenty of coolant if it has a liquid cooling system and don't charge every day on DC fast charging. You know, when you, most people don't realize that even just one 10 volt charging, if you're driving 40 miles a day or less, which is the vast majority of Americans, you can plug it into just a 110 outlet and trickle charge the car and refill it overnight. So you don't have to DC fast charge and DC fast charging is a little bit harder on the batteries. You, uh, my recommendation is use DC fast only when you have to. If you're on a long road trip, uh, one of your charges during the daytime is probably gonna have to be DC fast. But you know what? When you stop at a hotel that night, pick one that's got a level two charger and charge at that slower rate. It's still going to fill the battery completely up overnight, and you're going to extend that life of that battery. The other great news is the battery prices are plummeting. And so even if today it would cost, say, $7,000 to replace a battery, by the time you need to replace that battery, it's going to be less than half that. So for me, it's not a worry at all. Okay, but that is the out-of-pocket cost for the driver, the owner. It's not like the companies are going to offset the cost, or or, or maybe they will. Well, in the it's interesting that just this week, uh, General Motors announced that they're going to replace the battery packs in every Bolt EV and even the new EUV that just came out this year because of the uh, battery problem they've got with some LG batteries. And Rather than try to trace down the exact fault and find out exact which cars are affected, they're going to replace free of charge the battery modules, and they're going to start those people's eight-year, 100,000-mile warranty over again. Okay. Now, that's not to say that every manufacturer will do this going forward, but here, especially in this early um, beginning of the EV revolution, they want to make sure that they don't get a black eye over this one battery issue they had. So, you know, if you have a gasoline powered car, you're not going to go over 200,000 miles before you have to have that engine rebuilt. Well, that's going to be similar in cost to replacing a battery pack, say five, 10 years from now. Not to mention the brakes, which are regenerative, of course, on electric cars. I mean, once you, once you drive a car with those kind of brakes, you know, it's just, you, you don't want anything else. So I know we are out of time, but just quick, Two words from each of you. When do you think we'll get up to 25% of our fleet being electric, either in full or in part? Are we years away? Are we decades away? Oh, we're less than a decade. Yeah. Okay. That will be huge. It has to be, right? It has to happen, right? Oh, yeah. It's like, it, it's like the human population uh, after the Industrial Revolution when we didn't have infant mortality rates at 50% as we did during the Middle Ages. Okay. If People don't live to to uh, reproductive maturity. Your population is going to go like this. Once you get rid of, you know, childhood illnesses that kill pe that kill the population off before they're ten years of age, and you know things like maternal uh, uh, fatalities, you know, then you see the world population like that just absolutely take off. Um, that's going to be the same thing with electric vehicles is we'll knock off the, the lack of diversity. Okay. You'll have the big spark that's produced in purchasing behavior 
with the electric with the advent of the electric pickup truck you will see the you know what i'm working on um, with charging stations will eliminate range anxiety that'll be another reason why people who have hesitated in buying electric vehicles like okay well why not and then when you talk to them about total cost of ownership this car is actually better for your budget better for your wallet than an internal combustion engine vehicle they're going to say two words why not Hmm. so they're going to go with it and then they're going to have the buzz effect where they revolted they bought two chevy volts and then they got solar panels on their house and then they got uh all electric lawn equipment for that, which I do the same thing. I bought my bolt, put the panels on. I, I live a I live the clean energy economy lifestyle. It's awesome. It feels it does feel good. And is there enough lithium in the world for all of this? We'll have to save that for next time, unless there's a quick yes or no. Uh, so yes, there's more than enough lithium. I shot a quick link through the chat there. Countries with the largest lithium reserves worldwide. Everybody has seen that picture of uh, of a kid in Africa, you know, coated in white, and they say, "Oh, a special report inside the Congo cobalt mines that expose children." Like, okay, cobalt is not a really good choice for batteries because it's super toxic. However, lithium. Look at the periodic table. Okay, hydrogen, helium, lithium. It's the third lightest element. It's not found way down deep in the earth. It's found in salts of lithium, like lithium phosphate, and it's all like within the you know top 10, 20 feet. Um, just if you look at that link, Chile and, and Australia and Argentina have the are the countries with the largest lithium reserves in a uh, worldwide as of 2020. The United States is number five at 750,000 uh, metric tons of proved lithium. It's not someplace where you're going to start a you know a catastrophe and environment to, to mine lithium and even lithium isn't the best choice we'll have solid state batteries soon where you can have an 800 mile range please do find me in an, in an internal combustion engine vehicle any of them running on gas or diesel that you can get 800 miles of range on it's not there and one quick thing, uh, just recently, a lithium deposit was discovered in England, and they say there's enough there for 400 million EV batteries. And then the Salton Sea in California, they recently, uh, GM just set up mining there. So we're still finding new deposits. There's, there's plenty of lithium right now for the cars. I, I don't see that as being a problem at all. Glad to hear that. Buzz Smith, Ryan Baggett, you are two men on a mission. I wish you well on emission. I'm a woman on emission to disrupt media and to make environmental news not an afterthought, not a sometimes thing, but the most important news out there because we don't have a lot of time, do we, to make all this transition across no. our entire lives. <laughs> Thanks no. for having us on. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. We'll have you back again. There's so much to talk about, but really appreciate all your knowledge and taking time to share it with us.